What's up, everybody? It's Draymond Green. Make sure you subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel below so you don't miss any more of this great content going forward. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Draymond Green Show. I'm excited to have this next guest, uh, an all-star, but uh, the road wasn't quite pretty to an all-star game. You know, you're talking a guy who was the seventh pick in the NBA draft, uh, been traded a couple times, and a lot of guys started, or a lot of people, not guys, a lot of people started to count out, um, started to say he wasn't what they thought he were going to be coming out of college um, when he played one year at Arizona, was first team all Pac-12, uh, was drafted by the Minnesota Timberwolves and traded to Chicago. Um, absolutely incredible player, star of the Utah Jazz, Lowry Markkinen. For y'all that don't know how to pronounce his name, I just got the tutorial. Mike Lowry, just like the bad boys, Lowry Markkinen. What's up, my brother? Welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Happy to be here. Absolutely. Man, we've been trying to do this episode. We had we had a schedule earlier this week, and I all of a sudden my podcast bag didn't make it on the road with me. We just rescheduled it for today. My internet didn't want to work, so I'm actually filming this on my phone because I refuse to make Larry wait again. I refuse to miss this opportunity. Uh, but but first off, man, uh, how are you? Just how are you doing? First time All-Star. How is life, my brother? Life's great, man. Just trying to fight for this playoff spot. Uh, trying to focus on each game like it's our last. Uh, I mean, I can't complain. We're on a, like we just talked about, we're on a 13-day trip. So you know how much of a grind it is. So I'm as well as you can be. Absolutely. And, and speaking of that, uh, you know, I, I like to let the interview flow. And just speaking of, um, fighting for a playoff spot, I think it's absolutely incredible uh, what you guys have done this year. Uh, you, Danny Ainge comes in as the president of the Utah Jazz. He starts shaking a bunch of things up. Uh, everyone looks at the team when all the trades go down and say, uh, this team is going to be the worst team in the, in the NBA. And yet you guys are right there fighting for a playoff spot. Just just what's that been like? When y'all came into the season, Did y'all did y'all expect to be this good, or was it just like a thing that start coming together those first? I think y'all started seven or eight and zero or something like that. Yeah, so I wasn't here like the preseason pickup game period of time because I was overseas playing. So I got here right before training camp and just saw the first practice. I was on the sidelines and kind of like we got a lot of dudes who I think think that they have been counted out and have a chip mm -hmm. on their shoulder. So. Just we had to get on the same page. We had eight or nine guys coming from different teams too. So we knew it was going to take a lot of time and a lot of work, but then we got off to a hot start. And obviously that just that feeds your confidence and you just want to keep going. So I think that was our motivation, kind of people counting us out. And uh, like myself, there's a lot of players that maybe thought that their career was going in the wrong direction and uh, we wanted to prove ourselves. So. That was a big thing for us. And, and and again, speaking of making the playoffs, uh, recently at the trade deadline, you guys just traded two, um, well, what well, really more than two, but two in particular um, to the Lakers and Malik Beasley and Jared Vanderbilt, who were big parts of your rotation, obviously also Mike Conley leaving. But uh, with those two guys going to the Lakers, Mike Conley getting traded, and you're right in that battle trying to fight for a playoff spot. What's the mindset like uh, for yourself and for guys on the team when you trade uh, big pieces like that who's been contributing at a high level all year for you guys? I mean, yeah, it's tough. Well, obviously, the relationship part, and we had a good thing going on, and so that part sucks. But the conversation we had with front offices and everybody was just like, just need to trust us. And uh, I think the players are never going to give up. So we just try to find new ways to stay on top, <laughs> top of the surface and uh, just keep going. And I think it's an opportunity for other guys to step up and I'm trying to myself, trying to take that leadership part as well. Just trying to see where I can lead the team. And, and 
Also, speaking of trades, uh, like I said, you've been a, a part of a couple big trades. Uh, one with Minnesota with Jimmy Butler. Uh, this 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 particular trade with um with Donovan Mitchell going to the Utah Jazz. A lot of like I said at the beginning, a lot of people have counted you out as if you weren't the player that everyone had hoped for. Yet you're getting traded for all star guys like Jimmy Butler. You're getting traded for all star guys like Donovan Mitchell. Um, when you get traded in a situation like that, where it's four guys like that, do you somewhere in the back of your mind feel like, well, I, I can't necessarily be what they're saying I am because yet these big trades are still happening? I am the marquee guy uh, from my side of the deal that's going in these trades for these all star players at the time before you're an all star. Yeah, the Jimmy Butler trade, I didn't really even think of it most because obviously at the draft and you're a young kid, everything's just happening so fast. I'm trying to come in and, and play as well as I can. So I didn't even really think that much of that trade. But then by this Donovan Mitchell trade happened, I think just I understood the business side of basketball already. Like I loved being in Cleveland. I had a great year, great relationships throughout the whatever eight months I stayed there. And Love all the guys there, but I understood that, I mean, you have a chance to get a player like Donovan, like you probably can pull the trigger on it. So I understood it. So, I mean, it's always tough, especially with the family. It's just trying to survive in a new environment again. But I mean, as I mean, I can tell it was a blessing now for myself and my career, uh, getting in the right system and environment. So ironically, um, and watching Cleveland season, I think they're having a really good season. Um, a lot of teams have a really good season. And I look at that team now, and you're the missing piece. <laughs> and it's just funny how it all works out. It's like you get traded for Donovan Mitchell. And like you said, if you're the Cleveland Cavaliers, you have to make the trade. You, get a, you have an opportunity to get a guy like Donovan Mitchell. I understand it. But yet, in looking back on it, I just think it's funny that I watch that team, and I'm like, hmm. They're really, like, if they had a three-man with some great size, knock the shot down, that you could actually, like, put the ball in his hands. Because they play Karis LeVert at the three, but in my opinion, Karis LeVert is a two. You know, and so it's a little different. And so I think that's interesting. But um, speak to me, uh, growing up in Western Finland, at what point um, in your journey does it, be does it come to you that the NBA is a realistic goal? Yeah, I mean, wasn't able to watch like live NBA games growing up, and it was just all highlights, and so it doesn't really seem realistic. It's just so far away, and uh, my goal is to be a professional player and get to the national team level in Finland. That was my main goal, and then the college court opened for me, and uh, once I got to Arizona, I still wasn't on. I don't think I was on any mock drafts or anything. I don't. I don't know if that matters a lot, but I mean, I didn't, I wasn't seeing my name anywhere. So just first couple months at Arizona, just started playing pretty well. And then my name starts popping. Man, this might be a real possibility. That was right <laughs> around January, maybe. Like, That's crazy. really, I, I was going for college. A lot of guys say that they knew I'm a one and done, but in my mind, I was going there to get better. And I thought I'm going to be there multiple years. So I didn't think I was that close yet, but then season progressed and I thought I have to take the leap when you have the opportunity. So it really happened quickly in my mind because you just keep worrying about every day and grinding it out. And then two months before the draft, you're like, oh, I can do this. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and you, you just said, um, and growing up in Western Finland, you couldn't watch the games live. Uh, explain that to me because, number one, I think it goes to show how far the NBA has come. I think Adam Silver does an incredible job. But explain that to me, why you couldn't watch the game live. Was it a, a TV capability thing or, or compatibility thing, or was that the time difference was so dramatic that you just weren't able to stay up and watch the games? Yeah, just as a kid, uh, the games come at 3 or 4 a.m. So I just wasn't able to stay up. And I can't remember exactly, if, like, if I really wanted to wake up, I'm sure there would have been a way to some stream, just get on uh, online okay. and see the games. But I think it's easier now. And that's just so what you just said, just 
availability of the league just it's all over the world now and like i know my friends and family are easily watching my games they can watch it on league pass whatever so just i didn't have the opportunity and i think it was mostly the time difference obviously it's just can't can't be waking up at three or four a.m. and going to school at eight a.m. So, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, okay, and uh, you just spoke about like my goal was to be uh, on the national team, and I think it's. A, I, I want to dive into that a bit. Uh, so, just number one, um, how beneficial you getting traded to this to the Utah Jazz opened up a space where, you know, you're coming in and it's, like you said, it's a bunch of good players on the team, but not anyone that's become a superstar until, you know, you now you, you become an all-star. But coming into this season, no one's a superstar. Everybody, you know, y'all got a bunch of good players, but no one's a superstar. You come out of uh, Euro, Euro uh, championships, European championships, where you're with your your national team and you are a superstar, you are the star, you are the go-to guy. How did coming out coming immediately from there right into the NBA season in a position to where you could actually jump into that role? How much did that help you blossom into who you've grown into in this year in the Utah Jazz and you know who you will be now in the future uh, as the NBA continues to go as your career continues to go? Yeah, I think it's just about everything really clicking. Obviously, my confidence was super high going to the Eurobass and being the guy and seeing all different coverages and uh, trying to lead the team over there. But then just getting into Utah, and I, like you said, no real superstars. Every time, everybody trying to figure it out and just got to – I always give a lot of credit to coaching staff and teammates, obviously, but – the first thing Coach Hardy was like, yeah, we just need the same version that you were playing over there. We need it here. And uh, I think that that was a really big thing for me, just it being the guy in Cleveland who I took the challenge to guard the best players on the team and really try to do whatever a team needed me to do. And they still traded me. So that 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 was just the business <laughs> of basketball, that kind of switched my mindset too that I got the confidence back up and in the Eurobasket and just coming in with that and just try to keep that going. So that was a big mental switch for me too. It seems to me, um, it seems to me in in watching basketball, I've had the opportunity to uh, compete in two Olympics. So I've gotten pretty familiar with the international game. And it seems to me, um, Olympics, world championships, and Euro basket championships. It seems to me for the Europeans or really any country outside of America that winning those three is, is a much higher priority than necessarily winning the NBA championship. Is that, is that the case? And if so, why is that? Well, yeah, I'm not the ones who said anything about NBA champion. I haven't been close to that yet so you can probably compare that a little bit more but i mean i always take a lot of pride uh representing the national team obviously that's where we're from and trying to i'm the only Finnish guy in the nba i'm trying to kind of carry that torch over here as well and obviously my ultimate goal is to win the nba championship but mm -hmm. i haven't been to playoffs yet and so <laughs> i still got some ways to go but i think I mean, they're very important goals from both, but just maybe the I've always represented Finland my whole mm -hmm. life. So maybe that's why it could be a bigger deal that it's been a longer, long term goal for mm -hmm. myself since like NBA's really the last couple of years. So, but obviously, the I want to experience both. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think, um, you know, it's in, the way you just put it, like it's been a long-term thing. You guys, you 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 grew up in Finland. You've been that your whole life. You know these guys grow up uh, in France. Play with you the same guys growing up the whole time. Yeah, yeah. And so I I think it's like <clears throat> that pride for your country because here's the thing. I've over the last few years I've become uh, more of a football fan, and you know, and that's huge in Europe, and it's like a religion. You know, like like 
like football in Europe is like a religion. National team in Europe, you guys almost do national team every summer. Whereas for us, we usually get a team together uh, and, and maybe that particular team is together for two years. And, and so I think it's, it's kids in America, they grow up wanting to play in the NBA, you know, and you grow up like, man, I want to win an NBA championship. Once you get to the NBA, then it's like, wow, I want to play for Team USA. You know, like I want to I want to compete. I want to win a gold medal. But that's once you get to a certain point in your NBA career. You know, it's not necessarily like I grew up saying, man, I want to play on a national team. No, I grew up saying, man, I want to play for the Detroit Pistons. So I want to play for the Los Angeles Lakers. So I, I, to me, that's just been an interesting thing to watch um, as, as I've Maybe gone through my couple of a, journeys. Yeah, maybe it's more of a realistic goal as a kid, too, for myself coming from a smaller country to – it's much more realistic that I play in the, on the national team than I actually make it to the NBA and mm -hmm. play for a certain team here. So maybe that's part of it too. But uh, yeah, always take a lot of pride. Try to play every time I can. And I think I've played my best basketball in the NBA after having the summer with the national team, just being in good shape, coming back, right, mm -hmm. ready for training camp. I agree with you 100%. I actually played in the Olympics. The last time I played in the Olympics, I really wanted to play because I was coming off really too too shitty in my, probably two of my worst NBA seasons. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, I need to like come in a tip top. I, I need to do Olympics so I could come into the season in tip top shape so I could get back to all-star level. And it actually ended up working out that way. But I always tell people when you're coming off that Olympic, when you're coming off that Olympic summer or Euro championships or uh, world championships, like you come in in shape, you hit the ground running, it sets you up for the rest of the year. So I think that's, I think that's been a huge thing. But uh, I asked a question on 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 this podcast a couple of weeks ago to Gilbert Arenas, and I would love your take on it, being that you are European. Um, I would just love your your view on it. It's actually come up on television uh, once last week um, or earlier this week with Kendrick Perkins and J.J. Reddick. Now, I think Kendrick Perkins started talking white and black or, J or something white and black. My question was more so, um, do you think or why is it that I, mean, I have saw this list. Stephen A. put a list out, and it said top five players with the most pressure to win an NBA championship. It's like James Harden, someone else, someone else. Oh, Jason Tatum was number two or three, and Joker was number four. And so when I, when I saw that, I said, that's interesting to me because Jason is younger than Joker, number one. Jason is also not an MVP in the NBA yet. Joker's a two-time, possibly soon to be three-time MVP. How is he higher up on that list? And it brought me to a place where I'm like, I feel like Europeans um, or American-born players catch more flat, and it kind of goes into the same thing of what I was just saying about championships and, and how European players may feel. American players catch more flack for winning a championship than European stars do. Do you think that's the case? Um, but I, that's just what I've noticed. And, and that, that list really put it at the forefront for me. So I would love your opinion just as a European player. Uh, yeah, they might get away with it a little bit more. Uh, I haven't really thought of it, but so kind of putting me on the spot. But, uh, but I mean, <laughs> just... Like I said, I didn't really, I don't know what the conversations were like when, uh, like exactly when Dirk wasn't winning a championship yet mm -hmm. and to that, and then we, when he finally won one, uh, mm -hmm. what I got, there was some pressure for him to win one. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, may, I don't know, maybe it's from, I mean, it's a league, NBA is a league in America and we're coming from a different country to try to adapt and getting into your league. So maybe that's why, <laughs> but like, I've seen the, I've seen the list and uh, yeah, I, I hear more pressure talk being towards American players. So definitely noticed that, but just, 
I'm not really sure why. That's my thinking behind that. It's crazy because you just gave me a perspective that I had not thought of. And now that you say that, I can definitely think back to it, which is dirt. Uh, I remember now now that you say that, going back to 2010, 9, 2011, where Dirk is still, at that point, Dirk's been in um, Dallas for, what, 15 years, 14 years, somewhere around there. And you started to hear, like, man, Dirk is a great player. Uh, Dirk is incredible. He's this. But you can't necessarily win with him. They're not going to win with him, the guy in Dallas. They're facing the uh, Miami Heat. So now that you say that, I do remember that. I do remember uh, Dirk starting to catch flat later in his career, you know, in year 14 or 15. So I, I definitely uh, can appreciate that perspective. Um, fifth straight year. Fifth straight. And, I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely going to be the fifth straight year where, oh, we, oh, have a, straight. <laughs> where yeah. Yeah. we have an international player um, winning the MVP. Um, you know, Joker's right in it and B's right in it, Giannis, Luka. Uh, and then probably Jason Tatum is the fifth one to probably round out that top five. Um, what do you think it's doing for the game of basketball that uh, you're having Europeans um, winning MVP in the NBA year after year after year? I think that's, I think it's great for the game of basketball, and, and, you know, and its global footprint. But what do you think uh, it's doing for the game? Yeah, obviously, dude, it's just the more, I mean, more they be, they have done the. NBA is growing and it's all over the world now. Just be visiting a ton of like basketball without borders camps. There's so many good players coming from different continents and that's just great to see. Just obviously mm-hmm. it's known to be a lot of Americans in the league, but just having those superstar guys coming from different countries, but a lot of them are from Europe and so it's it's great to see, and I think the game's just going to keep growing and growing. Uh, but they're definitely a big part of it, just how much basketball has grown in Finland. And I see people wearing Giannis jerseys in Finland and stuff like that. So that's just awesome to see, and we're really in, in it together. Obviously, I would wish they wear my jersey, but I'm just grateful <laughs> to see that basketball is just growing and so many more kids are starting to play basketball because of those superstars. So they're doing a great job too. Well, you've, you've gone to the Utah jazz and become a star. You're an all-star, which means you'll have more television games next year, which means more and more people in Finland and all over Europe will start wearing your Jersey. So I think your wish will be granted, <laughs> my brother. <laughs> I, I definitely <laughs> think it will. Luke, Luca made a comment, um, some years ago, maybe his, his first or second year in the NBA, where he said scoring in your scoring in the NBA is way easier than scoring in Europe. Do you do you carry that same sentiment? Uh, partially, yeah. Uh, I think just what I noticed this summer, for example, in Eurobasket. Obviously, I didn't play Euroleague just like Luca did, but. So my experience is coming from a Eurobasket, but just definitely not getting the same foul calls that I am in the NBA. Uh, mm-hmm. No defensive three seconds, obviously shorter game clock, only 40 minute game. So I think that affects on like points per game averages already just. And so, yeah, I would probably agree. Uh, just it, it's a different game. Uh like you have one superstar on a European team, and like I, I was watching what. Obviously, Jan is a is a great player, superstar, and I was watching what Czech Republic was doing to Greece this summer, and they were literally five guys in the paint because there was no mm-hmm. three second rule. So that definitely affects that, and um, I don't know if it's. I still scored more in Eurobasket I had scored in the NBA. So I don't know if it's <laughs> completely true, but yeah, definitely he's on something. No, I I definitely can agree with the defensive three seconds. Uh you like when we went last year, we were playing against France and they were still playing like two legit centers, Rudy Gobert, uh Mustafa yep. Fall, uh Dustin Port. They're playing like legit two centers. We out there like, yo, what is this? Like this is crazy. Yeah. So it's definitely a different game. Um I'm a free agent. Sell to me to Utah Jazz. On you, you know, you're you'll be in Utah for a long time now, brother. Uh, sell, sell to 
me, a free agent, not literally me, but just you're selling uh, someone to come to Utah Jazz, join you as a free agent, uh, continue to help boost this team. You're talking about making the playoffs, and obviously then you 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 sniff that, you start wanting to make runs. So sell to me the Utah Jazz uh, as a free agent. Uh, what will Laurie Markin and say to free agents coming up? Because it's going to be on you to start recruiting, my brother. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm really enjoying staying there. Obviously, just a, I'm more of a low-key guy, so it's been a great city for me and my family be and uh, my kids to grow. Um, so off the court, everything's great. Just great organization taking care of us. And uh, game-wise, I always felt like Utah was one of the toughest places to play. And that's a fact. That's because of fan base, and they always have our back. So it's really fun to go play every night. And just we compete. We're trying to win that, get that uh, winning culture. And obviously, we have a great coach now. And uh, so I'm, I've been really enjoying this year. And we, we play hard. And uh, just having the fan base and people in Utah really love basketball. So you can see it all around. So I'm really happy to be a part of it. And hopefully, we get some. Guys coming over too. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredible. Um, <clears throat> you just spoke about having a great head coach. Now I actually had the opportunity to um I actually had the opportunity to to play uh with Will Hardy coaching. Uh he was one of our coaches for the for the USA team. Super cool dude, extremely knowledgeable, uh, very relatable. But just talk to me about um about Will Hardy as a coach. Like, you know. Everyone sees this this new face pop up on the sidelines of the NBA in, with the Utah Jazz. And, you know, people around fans d doesn't quite know who it is. Talk to me about Will Hardy as a coach and uh, what he's brought to the organization. I think it starts with just what you said. It's a really cool dude. You can talk to him off the court, have lunch with him, and just talk other non-related, non-basketball related stuff. And just, it, it really helps us on the court with us having that relationship. So it starts from there, but just a really smart coach. We've run, he's run plays for me this year that I've never had so, seen before and get it, you get a wide open layup off of it. And so <laughs> you can just tell that he, he's thinking on a different level. And uh, so I'm really excited to be building this relationship with him and, uh, so it's been a great experience in this, whatever, six months I've been in Utah. But yeah, just obviously first time head coach, young guy, but doesn't really look like is he's he's had a lot of experience with obviously being with under like great head coaches as well. So just he has that experience and uh, he's really taken this thing to another level. Yes. That's, that's incredible, I, and I, I think he'll continue to grow. I think he's one of the bright young coaches in this league, which I think is absolutely amazing. He's going to be good there and probably will be there just like yourself for a very long time. Uh, before we get out of here, man, you, you've mentioned your family uh, three times since, since we've been on here for 27 minutes, and I can't help but notice that as a family man myself, uh, I've been married now for six, seven months, seven months, six months. Uh, soon to be seven months. Uh, I have three children. Uh, just speak to me, number one, how many children do you have? And then also, um, what it's like uh, living his NBA life and being a father at the same time, going for 13 days currently right now. Just talk to me about what it's like being a father and, and, and living the world that we live in. Yeah, so I got a wife and a five five year old boy and a two year old daughter at home. So, I mean, it's everything. It's really helped me to play on this level at the same time. Like, obviously, it's tough to be away from the family and you want to spend the most time with them, obviously, but just they, they understand it's my job and I I respect them for understanding that. That requires a lot of time, oh, just not games and trips, but going in to get treatments and practices and extra work you have to put in. So, But they've really helped me in a way that I was struggling my first couple of years, really my first year, because our son was born my halfway through my rookie year. So, wow. but that, that already helped me that I had a problem with 
separating my not non basketball stuff from basketball. It was basketball is always just game. I played fun, and then now it's it's my job, and I'm getting paid for it. So I was in a gray area of kind of you want to enjoy it, but at the same time you have the pressure to perform. So just being married and get, having kids, I think he really helped me to separate the two. I have a bad game. It's a bad day at work. I close the locker room door and go play hide and seek with my son, whatever. So that really helped me in my basketball career, kind of enjoying the basketball and whatever happens, good or bad, I go home and it's, it doesn't matter anymore. So yeah. that's really helped me. And I'm really grateful for that. They walk in that house. They don't care if you won. If if you won, you're no, no. bigger of a superstar than if you lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. They don't care if I missed all my shots or made all of them. So, what what what's what's it like? So so I'll tell you one of the things I struggle with. I know we got to get out of here. Uh, I'll tell you one of the things I struggle with as a parent, and and it's it's my own head, um, which I can acknowledge, but. Growing up in Saginaw, Michigan, uh, you grew up in Western Finland, obviously two totally different places, um, but smaller places in the grand scheme of the, the world. I always um, fear my children not understanding the grind, you know, not understanding uh, or appreciating things and not understanding what it's like to be an underdog. I always fear, uh, you know, my kids growing up living the life that they're living. Um, how does how do how does that ultimately play out uh, when they're adults? For you, it goes even a step further. Whereas I'm still in America, although I'm not in Saginaw, Michigan, still in America. But for you, you actually have to teach your kid an entirely different culture. Uh, how do you go about that and, and balancing that uh, to un- to make sure that your kids who are growing up here in America for at least eight months out of the year, nine months out of the year, that they understand the Finnish culture, that they speak the language um, fluently, like how how fluently? How do you how do you go about making sure that they get that side of you? Yeah, it's definitely something you have to think about, and uh, that's pretty much the reason why I spend most of my off seasons back home in Finland, just to get my kids over there and trying to keep Finland important to them as well. Obviously their grandparents are there and everybody. So trying to keep it important, obviously who knows how long I'm going to play in the NBA, but they're probably teenagers at the time. So it's, it's going to be a tough decision at the end, like where are we going to be living? But I just want them to learn and appreciate both sides of it. And obviously you never know what's going to happen in the future, but so we speak Finnish at home. So that automatically kind of stays with us. So just spending time both places and learning, learning the different cultures and uh, make them really appreciate both of them, how different they are. And that's the main thing. And before we get out of here, world championships this summer, uh, Olympics next summer. Um, what can we expect from Finland with these two events coming up? Expect us to make some noise. I think we're getting better as a basketball country, and we're all confident going in. And uh, this is the first time we actually qualified through the through the games to the World Cup. So everybody's excited. Uh, we're going to bring a ton of fans over there, and. Uh, Hopefully we get to play you guys. <laughs> well, um, I hope so too, brother. I, I definitely hope so too. I I enjoy um, and, and when I'm playing uh, international competition, watching you guys go back home, like you go back home, and now you've become that player in the NBA as well. But like watching how good an Evan Fournier is at basketball. Uh, when he goes and plays for France, watching how Patty Mills, who's probably the greatest FIBA player ever, how good he is at basketball when he goes and plays for Australia. You know, you go into it with like this mindset, or we go and play Australia, and Matisse Thybul is walking into threes. Like, you go and watch guys, like, play with, like, their countries, man, and it's the most incredible thing. It's the most incredible experience. Um, 
Lowry, Mike, Lowry, marketing. My brother, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, man. You're welcome back anytime. You know, I I I try to go by this thing, man, and and yet I don't want to alienate anybody because we're always appreciative of all guests. But I always say, man, you gotta have a little resume to come on the Draymond Green show. You know, you can't you can't just be some guys out here talking and you know getting interviews and stuff. Like you gotta have a resume. You can't be Dylan Brooks or something, man. So I appreciate you coming on the show, my brother. <laughs> Appreciate you having me, man. That was fun. <laughs> no doubt, brother. Thank you. What's up, everybody? It's Draymond Green. Make sure you subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel below so you don't miss any more of this great content going forward.